ESL Hearthstone Legendary Series. This is day two of the Redemption Tournament. My name is TJ Osmo, QD Sanders, and Dan has left, and now I am joined with Gritor. Imagine if I introduced myself as Dan Fred Uncho. Yeah. I wonder how many people would recognize. <laughs> people would be like, oh, Dan just changed his shirt. Yeah. Got, no big took, deal. Took off his glasses. How you doing, man? I'm doing great, man. Glad to be here. I'm, uh, I'm obviously here to cast some Hearthstone, but also I'm in town for some WCS StarCraft II action, which I'm really excited for. Mm -hmm. Very clearly, I mean, Blizzard puts out some great games. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the guys coming up was actually a former StarCraft II pro, which is really exciting. My good old friend Strife Crow. Indeed. Of course, next matchup is Strife Crow. Uh, he's going to be taking on Cross 7224. Now, uh, Cross is, uh, we saw him in week four. Um, which was just last week, and we casted that together as well. Um, he had a pretty rough performance. Yeah. Uh, he tied for seventh, which is the bottom. He was one, the, um, one of the first two players eliminated, and he only had a total score of three wins and six losses. Um, so it was it was a really rough day for him. Stripecrow, on the other hand, actually did quite a bit better. Uh, he placed fifth in his group, um, and he had a total score of five and eight, which isn't that great. Uh, but one of his losses was to the eventual winner, Life Coach, and eventual semifinalist, Azuzu. So. Uh, he had arguably uh, tougher opponents, and of course, Strife Crow is known to be one of the most consistent, competitive Hearthstone players in the entire scene. Yeah, if you look at the Ghost of Gamers ranking, you always see him all the way up on the top, whether he's, you know, top 10. I know it fluctuates quite a bit, especially with the new talent that's being brought in yeah. by just, you know, continuous tournaments. It's just a fact. Give mm -hmm. it more time, give more tournaments, and you'll see more and more players popping up here. But Strike Crow has maintained. He's had that uh, perennial summit, that perennial peak that he's just been able to maintain there. Uh, and obviously everybody expects great things from him. The guy is, I would say, um, really, really good at understanding sets of games. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I think is Strike Crow's greatest strength is his ability to think many, many turns ahead to pinpoint his win condition uh, in games where there's not really a clear win condition many turns in advance. And sometimes you'll see him make plays that seem very suboptimal for the current state of the board. But then he'll win that game, and you look back on it and you say, well, he wouldn't have been able to win if he didn't make that play that one turn. So um, it it's, can sometimes be amazing. Now, Cross, on the other hand, um, he, had, he played Priest in his week. Did not do well. It was pretty underwhelming, and our um, our the technical director of our show actually talked with Cross, uh, I believe yesterday or this morning, and he said he, he thinks that, uh, Cross said that he thinks um, he made some mistakes with his decks in the first round, and that that sort of, the, the pressure is has sort of been lifted from him to bring good decks, and now he can just bring uh, whatever he wants, or he, he has a chance to refine, he's not like pushed uh, he doesn't. He hasn't. He's had like more than a couple days to actually make his deck list. So um, he feels like he's going to bring stronger decks to this tournament. He feels like he's going to be better off, and uh, we'll see if he can have a better performance. And I think Cross is one of the guys that's also free to play, if I'm not mistaken. Oh yes. So he <laughs> is complete. Wow. He's also Chansey. He's also Chansey. Uh, I mean, to be in the high level competitions and also to have a free to play model. That's um. That's something to be said. I mean, a lot of experience shown right there. And uh, will definitely be very, very interesting. So overall, um, you know, I think it's going to be a very clear overdog, underdog situation. Mm -hmm. uh, as Cross didn't perform that well. We've talked about it. Stripe Crow has been performing well uh, and has just been dominating, honestly. Yeah. Uh, now, it appears as if Cross is the only player so far, or in the whole day, that's going to be bringing Mage. That's pretty crazy. Yesterday, we only had one mage player as well, and uh, it was too wet, and he didn't do very well. Well, he did okay. What did he bring? He brought, like, a tempo mage. Okay. Um, I've been seeing that up on the ladder a lot more. I don't think it's... Yeah. I, I kind of feel like it's the jack-of-all-trades master of none at this point. Yeah. There are, there are better, like... I don't know. There, I think there are better decks out there that accomplish the same thing. Yeah, well, uh, mage was popular for a while because of freeze mage, but with the popularity of warrior just increasing so much, and mid-range hunter, um, and even handlock, these decks just eat freeze mage up. Sure. Uh, as far as tempo mage goes, uh, if they don't get a good start and can build that tempo, they fall flat on their face as well, so it's a little mm -hmm. bit inconsistent. A lot of the decks right now can prey on it, but we'll have to see what type of mage uh, Cross is actually bringing. And uh, of course, Warrior Druid um, seems to be pretty standard, and then we saw briefly Hunter Warrior Warlock, which in my opinion, and I talked about it a little bit yesterday, Hunter Warrior Warlock 
which should be everybody's lineup right now. And yesterday we saw six out of the eight players or no, there's only six players. It was one there was only one player or two players that didn't bring it. Today there's No wait. Okay. I just confused myself. It was five out of the six players yesterday that that all had nearly the same lineup. They all had um Hunter Warlock Warrior or um Hunter Warlock Druid. So, so it was pretty much the same decks all the way across the board. Sure. And um there was like five warlocks, five warriors and five hunters. It was ridiculous. So I have a question for you because, you know, in, in poker terminology, if we're, like, bringing the same lines, basically, or same, it's not quite the same thing, but mm -hmm. if we're playing the same lines, we're just trading wins, and we're just letting RNG decide yeah. who's winning the games. Uh, do you think it's a case like that where, you know, they're just letting RNG decide it, or is there enough of a discriminator out there to really tell, like, oh, we're bringing the same decks, but I'm able to play a little bit better than you and get, like, maybe a 2% or 5% edge here. Well, the thing about these classes is the reason why they're strong is because there's multiple variations that all play very differently and all have very different matchups. Gotcha. Um, Warlock has, like, four strong archetypes right now. It's got uh, Zoo, um, Handlock, uh, the Dragon Warlock, and Combo Warlock, which I would say are all... Uh, pretty strong right now. Even Combo Warlock, some people are like, oh, Combo Warlock's not strong. You're an idiot. No, Combo War Warlock, we actually saw it yesterday, I believe, take a couple victories um, because there's some decks that, like, mm. a lot of combo decks now, especially Patron Warrior, that require some build-up time. Mm -hmm. And decks like that can punish decks that have a slow build-up time. Um, Warrior has Control Warrior and Patron Warrior, and Hunter has Mid-Range Hunter, Face Hunter, and also Mid-Range Face Hunter Hybrid. So all three of those decks have multiple gotcha. multiple archetypes that play very differently, that are different to play against. Uh, that's what makes them strong. And so the the likelihood that we're going to see a straight up mirror matchup with the same class and the same deck archetype is pretty low. And in those ones, yeah, mirror matchups are the ones sure. that are most susceptible to RNG. But outside of that, I think uh, we're going to see some really great series today. Okay, very interested, very clearly, to see what comes of it. Uh, just to let you guys know and keep you guys up to date with what's going on. We are getting everything getting together. Uh, there's just a, a couple of slight mishaps that are going on very clearly with the player Skypes. We're going to get that fixed and uh, get ready to go ASAP. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Strife Crow. We talked oh, a lot about Cross. But... I, I did want to talk about Strife Crow because he's another guy that I learned about uh, Hearthstone a lot. Um, you, you talked about it perfectly when you were saying that Strife Crow, he does a lot of technically like inefficient plays if you're looking at that specific turn in a vacuum. Yeah. Um, and then he, as we were talking about before, he, he plays in like sets. He understands like the entire game and the purpose. He understands the entire set and what he's trying to accomplish with each game. And I, I actually perused his YouTube one day. I didn't realize that he had one. Uh, I perused it and I just found all of his content. He does multiple gate or multiple classes very clearly, and he just goes in depth on all of his de decisions every single turn. It's really really interesting to get inside the mind of a guy that is so cerebral and complex. Yeah, and I mean, his his results have sort of shown just how smart of a guy he is. Yeah, uh, he has. He's also one of the players that plays Hearthstone the most at anybody. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, he works super hard. He plays a lot of, uh, practices a lot, makes sure he um, is up to date on his decks. Um, Cross is a player that's very unknown. He's a Japanese okay. player, and he was saying that um, he's actually pretty well known in Japan. Um, he's sort of on the same level as Japanese players like Koroniko, who's recently been picked up by the team Hearthletics, who participated in one of the weeks of the Legendary Series. We'll actually be seeing him, I believe, tomorrow play in the Redemption Tournament. Um, where people sometimes see him on ladder uh, in in North America, but like they don't really have a really good idea of who he is, as gotcha. opposed to like uh, a lot of the Japanese players know each other. They're a tight knit group because there's just not that many at the high, highest level. And uh, he he said that he's really really wants to make a a bigger name for himself. And uh, even if he wins here, he he still wants to continue to work hard to try and make it even bigger, even beyond the legendary series. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, everybody has the, those high aspirations. I mean. Uh, regardless, it's going to be a great experience playing against yeah. a guy like Strife Crow. If he's able yeah. to beat him, that's awesome. Uh, if he's not, it's still awesome. It's like I I always see these tournaments as great learning tools, mm -hmm. no matter what. Uh, just being you know in the competitive scene for quite a long time. And uh, speaking of that, Kong or uh, Strife Crow has been in the competitive scene for a long time. If you guys haven't known before, 
uh, since I want to say 2010 or 2011. He was on Evil Geniuses in the StarCraft II era. Yeah. And he was one of America's premier players. So for him to transition into Hearthstone and also be at the top, very, very impressive. He, I think he's a lot more commanding in Hearthstone, though, relative to the scene than he was in StarCraft II. But it just shows you the evolution of a player and a person's mindset. Really, really cool. Yeah. Uh, we should be jumping into the match momentarily, but um, before we do, uh, we'll just want to touch one more thing. Um, of course, we want to. I just want to mention the last chance qualifier. Um, we'll have we have four players that qualify through the regular season week for the legendary series. We're gonna have four players through the redemption tournament, and uh, at the end of next week, we're gonna have um, eight players compete in the last chance qualifier, which is uh, an open tournament. Um, only available to North American players because of flight and visa restrictions. Mm -hmm. uh, that'll make up the final eight. So, um, briefly, before we jump into this match, legendaryseries.com for more information. But now we're finally able to jump finally. in! Finally! Man, we were vamping forever. Yeah. Forever. All I want is the action, man. Yeah. I want to see the, the hearth cards drop down like nobody's business. I feel All like right. Cross is trying to seduce me with that photo. It's an intense stare, dude. Hey, baby, you want to sling some cards? That's what do you say. You didn't notice. What are you replying to? <laughs> this looks like a face hunter. Speaking yeah. of faces and hunters. You know how I feel about this. <laughs> how you feel about <laughs> cross or how face you feel hunters. about face hunter? Okay, okay. You know how I feel about face hunter. How do you feel about face hunters, Andre? Well, I asked you last time. How come we haven't seen so many face hunters? Is it because it's not good in the meta? Or these people have self respect? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, apparently it's part of the meta. Last week, a mid range hunter had a lot of stronger matchups because there was more handlock. Uh, there was more. Um, Can you. I'm sorry. I've seen this before. Okay. This hungry crab. Yeah, you got it from uh, Unstable Portal. Oh, thank God. Yeah. I don't think anybody would run Hungry Crab in an actual deck. The only person who's ever run Hungry Crab in an actual legitimate deck was Trump at the Seed Story Cup number one, or one of the Seed Story Cups. Um, but back then, Murlocs were actually popular. Nowadays, if you actually put Hungry Crab in a legitimate constructed deck, you would probably lose every single game you'd play. Okay. And it's really rough to get that off of an unstable portal just because... That's brutal, man. You're effectively wasting the mana that you would because anything ab above uh, three cost, you're you're wasting most yeah. of the mana that you use to even use Unstable Portal in the first place. So yeah. there's some cards that can be highly impactful, uh, even if they're lower cost, but that's just really brutal. Flame Waker and Toshley. The synergy. You get the spare parts from Toshley, and you can use those to fire out the Flame Waker. I've been waiting for someone to bring out a deck like this. You just have to wait until turn 7 to yeah, actually activate it. But, I mean, Toshley's a strong board by itself. For 6 mana, 5-7 is really yeah, strong. Yeah, it's true. A lot of players talk about the, the uh, special effects of Sylvanas and Shield Maiden, but their bodies are is one of the reasons that makes them strong. So Toshley costs the same amount of mana, but has more health. So the, the spare parts is just sort of a... A secondary bonus effect. Sure. You get a spare part every time it goes out in the field, and then when it leaves the field. Exactly. And if you draw a silence from... I don't think anybody And then you get a duplicate. <laughs> oh, my God. Six spare parts. Yeah. That'd be ridiculous. Yep. To play a, a deck revolving around Toshley. Mm -hmm. You can play Gazlo, too. So every time you, you play those... Um, you, get a, you draw a mech. Every time you play those spare parts, you draw a mech. Mm -hmm. That'd be pretty cool. Did you see the dream scenario, by the way, with uh, two flame walkers and two knife jugglers, and then they played a mirror entity? You haven't seen that? No, no. I think it was on Reddit, but what a dream scenario, right? You play mirror entity, there's two bodies that go on the field, so knife jugglers uh, hit twice, and then you get uh, the spell. Oh my god. So it's the flame walker I think double shot. Even shotting. without anything else, just having two flame walker, flame wakers on the board and knife juggler would be a dream scenario, yeah. even if you didn't have mirror entity. Yeah, right? Like, you could have anything in your hand. Yeah. But Mirror Entity, you cost one. It's the most efficient uh, one drop. Oh, Mirror Image. Or Mirror Image. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Mirror Image. Yeah, um, yeah. It's the most efficient one drop that you could possibly get. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Mirror Image. Yeah, that's Dream Scenario. Double, no, you, can, wouldn't you, be able, you wouldn't even have room to double Mirror Image. 
Yeah, that's ridiculous. The dream. That's Missile Mage at its at its finest. At its finest, man. All well, right. uh, Temple Mage, I think, actually is pretty decent against Hunter, just because you have a lot of ways to ping off small things. Like, Flame Waker is great at pinging off one health creatures. Uh, a 2-4 for three mana is able to trade into a lot of the shenanigans that Hunters can put out on turns three and four. Um, Knife Juggler especially. Uh, the big thing here is though curving out. I mean, he actually didn't even have any spells to even combo with that uh, with that Flame Waker. So that's a little bit rough, but but very similar to like the you know the Mech Warper. Like you have to get rid of that that uh, Flame oh, yeah, Walker yeah. so so fast. It basically has Taunt on it, and that's why it gets targeted down. And still, like having four hit points go towards a minion rather than your face, such a helpful scenario in this current position. Strife growing a little bit of a pickle here. I mean, he's, you know, albeit pretty far behind right now just because of the taunt. The double secrets are up, which uh, are super, super threatening. Yeah. And then what I, is his turn five play? Like, this stinks, man. He's going to have to check for Counterspell here, which it is. I believe it's Counterspell and Mirror Entity. Usually these Temple Mages run two Mirror Entities and one Counterspell. Um, if you put Sludge Belcher in, there is a possibility that you can run Duplicate, but I would imagine that um, with Tempo Guards like Flame Waker, Mirror Entity is a lot bigger of a tempo play mm -hmm. than Duplicate. So, uh, And that's exactly what it is going to be. So, um, That's wow. kind of rough. Now, this Hunter is sort of the hybrid Hunter. It's the hybrid between face and mid-range Hunter that actually just became popular yesterday when Trump made his way through the Legendary Series Redemption Group A with it. And uh, this deck seems to run two freezing traps, and that seems to be pretty standard. So, okay. and that's exactly what we see. Beautiful play here. I mean, is able to proc, maintains the one-two taunt, which is actually pretty helpful. And now Toshley on a clear board, even with this uh, this Savannah popping out here, it's going to be one-shotted pretty easily. Of course, the minions will pop out, but hey, that's closer to empowering your mana worm, empowering your eventual second flame walker. Yeah. That's the dream, man. Mm hmm Nevertheless, uh, do you actually just go for face here, though? Pilot is Treader. Mm. Just check out. How much health does he have? 25 health. Um. Because it's 25, 25. Like, you could conceivably race your opponent here. Yeah, that's a good point. It's really hard for him to trade in. He's only got one card in his hand, so even if that card had, like, the most amount of bursts possible, then still... Yeah, looks yeah, like he is going to go for, for that. Uh, he also sits it up if uh, Sharpko finds himself in a position where he feels inclined to go face. He sets it up for a flame cannon next turn. Hmm. Makes so. sense. And we're probably just going to relinquish our hand at this point if we're Strife Crow. Yeah, and he's got to clear off some things here because yeah. there's a lot of lethal uh, cards that could be in Cross's hand. I mean, he has 13 damage, 14 damage from the board, plus... Hero power alone. So either frost, any frost bolt, um, any fireball, uh, even just like a whirling of blades, and one other spare part would would be enough. So sure. he's got to try and clear as much power off the board here while still setting himself up in a position where he can actually find lethal damage with the next couple of cards. And he's actually going to go for the trade in Toshley. Oh, man. Gets rid of that, but of course adds another spare part. Man, this Mana Worm is going to be jacked, man. He's not going to mess around. Oh, oh my it's a Nidus God. in combination now, with the Cloak Field. Is it? No, it's it's definitely the, the turn to play here. Yeah, I mean, all <laughs> you do... Okay, so let's see. Strife Girl has 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 damage on the board with no cards in his hand. <laughs> the maximum amount of damage he can do would be Quick Shot for 3. And then Hero and Power then he, 2. And then and Hero then. Power for 2, and then into a Kill Command. So that would be an extra 9 damage. Oh my God. So even the maximum amount of damage that Strife Girl could possibly do next turn would yeah. be 21. I think he's just going to trade into the Hyenas and just maintain his two uh, creatures on the board. I don't see why like you would go for the trade on the, the pile of the Shredders at this point. Yeah. Just reduce the as much damage as possible because you know you're going to have... To be honest, I think you just go face. Go for face? There's no reason. Like I said. Yeah, there, yeah, there's, you're right. There's absolutely no reason, uh, no way that Strife Crow can kill Cross. Yeah, you're right. And yeah, this way, right. he, he sets up lethal with just double fireball. Um, and this way, he also has a potential for lethal even 
if there's a low theb because he has five damage from his stealth creature sure. plus six damage from a mine, nine mana fireball. That's so he true. sets him up in a position where he has a guaranteed win next turn and there's no way that he can die. So very well played and Cross is going to take first victory. Sharp Crow goes down in the series. Very surprising, but you know, that's kind of what we can expect from those uh, like Hunter decks. Like a lot of times, well, first off, this Tempo Mage does reasonably well against it. We were talking yeah. about it. Mm -hmm. uh, you were talking. I actually felt like, you know, going into it, I have this um, presumption, I would say, that, you know, the Hunter kind of fulfills a little bit the same purposes as uh, these Tempo Mages, especially the mid range, where it's like they're putting out a lot of lethal damage and hopefully snowballing, right? Yeah. And it's just a different way of snowballing for sure. But um, I feel like they it's very draw dependent. For, yeah. for both of them. Yeah. Uh, whether or not Mage is more draw dependent than Hunter or vice versa, I'm not sure yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Sharko's still going to have to find a win with that Hunter. We've seen that Hunter have a lot of success over the past couple days, so I'm sure he won't have difficulties finding a win. Cross has Warrior and Druid left. Uh, now, Sharko's lineup is Hunter, Warrior, and Warlock. There's a reason why players aren't bringing in Druid as often. It's because a lot of the decks that are strong right now Prey on druids. Uh, Zoo Warlocks, the mid range face hunter hybrid, and Grim Patron Warrior all have pretty decent matchups against druid. Um, there's a lot of players that are comfortable with druid, and a lot mm -hmm. of players that think that druid has, at worst, a 40% chance to win uh, an individual matchup because of cards like Innervate and Wild Growth. They can get out to explosive starts. But I do think druid has been sort of shuffled out of the top five. Uh, decks currently in the meta for like the last two days and we'll see if if cross is going to manage to Find a win in the series with Druid as his deck. I'm sure he's happy to get the win with mage out of the way in the first game yep. But so gonna be a tough battle Definitely so big question is what type of warrior is this and of course what type of Warlock Shrife Crow I know has been favoring handlock though He has been playing it a lot as of late. Mm-hmm um, yeah, that's true. Uh, he's been playing a lot of it on stream and in ladder, but... That's kind of like, you know that I know... Yeah, Strife Crow that uh, type of thing. is not one of the predictable players. Yeah. And it's not that he wants to be unpredictable. It's that Strife Crow just is open-minded with the, the, the strength or the competitive level of decks. There's been many tournaments where Strife Crow has b brought a deck that... Nobody even knows where it came from. It's like a Strife Crow original that came from nowhere that nobody expected would be strong that did. And um, we go back to like Dream Hack of last year, or one of the Dream Hacks, where he introduced Grinder Mage, which didn't even have a name back then. It was just like Mage that went to fatigue a lot and won a lot of games. And it was just a bunch of, it didn't look like it had much synergy with each of the cards that had in its deck. It just had a lot of grindy cards and he ended up w winning the whole thing with that or uh, maybe even taking runner up I can't remember it just went really far and so I, I would never peg Stripe Grow to bring a certain type of deck over another would you say that's his like greatest advantage in a lot of these matchups and also I I, I kind of want to branch off of this and say is this format the best for Stripe Grow because we are in a locked in format uh, and you're you're saying that like the best is when he's surprising people with these decks and a lot of times, as soon as you show your deck, like, everybody knows. Um, and I feel like uh, the, the best format for Strife Crow in particular is if they have new decks every single best of series. Yeah. I think Strife Crow is just all around good. I think no matter what format just, he plays in, he's going to be good. I mean, as you said, he plays so much. He just has so much experience. Yeah. He's been in a lot of these spots. Yeah. So thinking is almost out of the question. It's like... He's going back to muscle memory. He's going back to positions that he's already recognized before in the past. Yeah. And he will very clearly and quickly see the right decision. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Cross is going to throw out a patron warrior here. Strife Crow. Mid-range zoo. Seems to be. All right. Seems reasonable. Actually. No. Yeah. I want to see the rest of those cards. Because those cards don't give away as much. But yeah, it looks like there's still a possibility that it could be Demon Warlock because sometimes, like Silent Storm, when he makes his Demon Warlocks, he puts in one or two board colors uh, and Abusive Sergeants. But it's most likely mid range too. 
<laughs> Dodge Boom doesn't really give us anything no. either. Cards I'm looking for are cards like Haunted Creeper or Flame Imp. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Imp King Boss doesn't really give us anything either. Oh, man. It's like I'm 99% sure that it's just standard mid-range demon, like the mid-range demon zoo, but maybe if we see a demon heart, it'll change my mind. It'd be crazy. Yeah. 10-12 Doom Guard. That's very scary. Or okay. killed Emperor what? Thorson. No. Very. Neither one. Yeah. All right. So I actually have seen uh, some of Life Coach's decks where he actually throws in this Void Caller too. Um, I don't know if it's like a useful card because I have heard. Uh, who did I hear it from? Was well, it, I've heard that. Was it me? Like, I don't think so. This okay. is like a while ago where everybody was saying it might have been Raynad actually that he was saying like the Void Caller is actually really important in the early stages. To defend against a lot of stuff, but this Void was Walker? before. Or, I'm sorry, Void Walker. Yeah. Uh, this is before like Zombie Chow was out and stuff like that. That was mm -hmm. a lot better. Um, yeah. But I feel like I, it's a card that maybe could mess with your opponent. But as soon as you put Imp Gang Boss, it's it's clearly over. But I'm positive that I was looking at like all the different alterations. I think it was on. They did like a, a analysis on Ghost of Gamers, and they showed like how how many different hand locks uh, Life Coach brought out. And I would assume that it's to mess with their opponents to to actually say, hey, this might be Zoo. You know, he's merging ranges, basically. Especially players that are in the spotlight a lot. Yeah. That a lot of the matches that they play, their decks are broadcasted to the world. That's... It can be... Mm -hmm. overstated yeah. how, how big of an advantage that is. Like, if I'm going up against Life Coach, just because Life Coach is streaming his games and he streams so often, like, I have an in inherent advantage. Yeah. And, of course, he doesn't know what I'm capable of. <laughs> I can do anything. He doesn't know what I'm capable of. <laughs> he has no clue, bro. Uh, and the stuff like that, like, what do you prefer prepare for? You have to prepare for, a lot of times, worst-case scenarios. You defend against everything. Yeah. You right. become inefficient. Anyway, let's talk about the game. This turn is awkward. Just because uh, Cross doesn't really want to put him on not having a DM. I mean, he's got five cards. He played Void Caller with a lot what? of confidence. No. Which means there's probably a demon on the other end of that. Yep. And he doesn't have any way to remove whatever's going to come out of that. So if a Doomguard pops out, if Malganus pops out, uh, he's in a rough situation. But um, Strifecore is going to be able to plop this out if he wants to. He's basically trying to call the bluff, I'm sure. A free Doom Guard. That's right. Effectively. Oh, he has to make sure that he throws out the Imp Gang boss first. So Imp Gang boss and a Ruby and Egg, and then you get your Doom Guard. Sounds like a reasonable turn to me. <laughs> I don't mind that whatsoever, man. Yeah. That's an explosive turn there. I yeah. Um, if he's planning to go face with the Doom Guard, he wants to make sure that he doesn't throw out the Haunted Creeper. Just because that allows the Acolyte of Pain to get one more draw. Mm. And he also has an activator for the Nerubian Egg in the Abusive Sergeant. So yep. there's no reason to not play the Nerubian Egg in that situation. And he sequen or he, he positions this really well. He knows that the Doom Guard is going to come on the far left for, or the far right. And uh, he positions his Imp Gang Boss on the far left because uh, the Imps spawn on the inside side of the Imp Gang Boss. So that way, if he gets a card like Direwolf Alpha that he puts in the middle, yeah. um, he can no. use that. Uh, he utilizes the Imps to maximum effectiveness and also is able to activate his egg. So putting the egg in the middle. Smart man. Smart move. Several moves ahead. Uh, now we have a, <laughs> a weird turn five. Like, what do you do in this spot when you have no executes, like I am a lot of times very scared to actually put any creatures on the board. I'm more willing to take damage from the um, the Void Caller than to activate it, just because I know it's just such a swingy turn if I, if I, well, if this situation actually happens. Yeah. Uh, but now that you're in this situation, like what, what have you possibly prepared to ready yourself? Do you just go for the kill with, yeah, this Inner Rage, um, the weapon and the cruel taskmaster. No, nope. he's, nope. I think you got to play low up here, okay. um, just because you needed the biggest body on board as possible to be able to match with whatever's going to come out here. Okay. 
and uh, he doesn't even check for the second draw from the Acolyte because he knows, oh man, Despite, man, he, he's just not finding ways to be able to deal with this, and, um, oh well, power I mean, warming would be fantastic. Despite power would have been able to deal with that, though, and you have the charge left over. Would that have been worth it or no? Because, like, my original thought process was we get our Fire War Axe, Cruel Taskmaster, that's four damage, and then, of course, we, uh, we um, power yeah. up the Acolyte, and that yeah. would have been able to kill it. We still have a weapon on the board. Yeah, maybe he thought he was running out of time. Uh, it could have been just... He got nervous? Get in there. Uh, I think yeah. nervous is the wrong word. But well, he, he, he didn't really think of the consequences sure. of, oh, I'm going to get a second draw from Acolyte? Well, didn't even check, played the little them and said, yeah. oh, Warsong Commander is actually a good draw, but he doesn't have enough mana to yeah. sort of open up any sort of opportunities for him. Definitely a rough turn yet again. I mean, it's because of the huge momentum switch that we had in turn five. Oh, I mean, he has to start clearing stuff off the board. Okay, so if he cle if he plays Emperor Thorson and clears the uh, Doom Guard here, he's left with nine damage total on the board. He's at thirteen health. Power Overwhelming kills him. Kills him. Second Doom Guard kills him. But he would have used Power Overwhelming last turn. To clear off the Lotheb. That's true. Most likely. Most likely. Um, if he had it. So he can put him on pretty much just second Doom Guard to win or a top decked uh, Power Woman. Because Defender of Argus wouldn't do it. He would need usually a multiple card combination. And next turn, uh, he can actually make some pretty big combos because he's reduced not only the Frothing Berserker, but also the Warsong Commander. So he can seven mana. I mean, he's got three mana left over after those two cards. He can, like, Battle Rage for one, look for a two drop. He can even Cruel Taskmaster to try and help clear up some stuff. Definitely has a lot to do. I wonder if you just tap here looking for the extra four damage. I, probably not, right? But just because, I mean, there are three cards that can help you out of your total, your deck, so you're looking at like 15% that you draw into. Well, oh, it's a little bit better than that. I just assumed 20 cards. Yeah. It's around there, but it's less than 20 cards. Probably like and also, 16, he 15. has, it's turn seven, and he has Dr. Boom. The one thing that he's worried about by playing Dr. Boom is that he opens up a world of hurt to himself sure, if sure. there's something like Warsong Commander, right, Grim Patron, and then like a Whirlwind. Because then uh, there's like potentially four Grim Patrons, yeah. all that can plop into these Boom Bots, get even more Grim Patrons. He's got to make sure he secures the victory over the next couple of turns. Oh, man. There's that whirlwind, but he's missing a pretty big component, I would say, overall. Uh, even if he goes and tries to draw for it, he will not have enough mana to actually play everything. As you can see, he's at seven mana. He still doesn't have his Grim Patron. He, he can live. What he can live. And the way he lives is by using Warsong Commander. Yeah. Um, Froth it up. Whirlwind. Frothing. He might even want to throw out the cool Taskmaster just to reduce the chances that the Frothing Berserker gets killed by the Boom Bots because the Frothing oh, Berserker yeah. is actually the way that he kills the Dr. Boom. Okay. Um, He's going to go for the Inner Rage. Yeah. Either way... Wh what is he drawing for with going for the Inner Rage? Potentially an Execute. Oh, yeah. That's true. Yeah. So, yeah. Throwing the cool Taskmaster out there first. Oh, but if uh, he's going to go for Warsong... He wanted Warsong first, right? No, 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 no. He wants to also reduce the chance that his Warsong Commander doesn't die. Okay. So maybe not. This is this is the best way to protect the Frothing Berserker if that's the choice that he's going to go with. But okay. the only way he lives here is if he uses Warsong Commander, Frothing Berserker, Whirlwind, and then kills the Doctor Boom with the Frothing Berserker. Oh, he's actually going to Whirlwind first. Well, no, that doesn't work. He did. Yeah. He did. I'm not really sure what he was going for there. But Striper was going to tie up the series. There you go. Uh, difficult position. I mean, we can really pinpoint it to turn five. Um, okay, so it really comes down to that decision to actually proc the Death Rattle and get that Doom Guard out. Of course, he doesn't know there's that Doom Guard. Well, he didn't even proc it. He just let it go. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's it true. Was Stripe Grove. But basically, he proc'd it, right? Like, he's putting himself in a situation where he allows his opponent to get that Doom Guard out. And a lot of times, like, you can throw out taunts, but just make sure that that minion still lives 
or they have to use something uh, like um, like power overwhelming. Yeah. And it dies so that the charge isn't triggered directly after that. I think Cross played about as best he could with the hand that he was given, maybe with the exception of that last turn, because he could have survived for another turn to try and open up opportunities. So you're saying turn five, there's no mistakes there? Like uh, that's that's uh, the winning line or the correct line? There's nothing else that he could have done. He would have had to play a creature eventually. Eventually, that Doomguard yeah. would have come out. But uh, I'm saying, like, you always have to, you always have to just run into it. Like, what about waiting and waiting for more mana or a potentially better drop or just throwing out the accolade of pain and dodging the Doomguard? It's possible. Or uh, dodging the the Void Caller. It's possible. Because, like, I feel like if you're not ready to confront the very, you know, the huge range, because there are, it could be Malganus. It could be another Void Caller. It could be the Doom Guards. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. It just puts yourself in a really rough spot no matter what pops out of there. Yeah. So kind of play around it. I'm, I don't know if that's the correct thing either because, you know, playing around it, it's like they could be bluffing now and you could be playing really inefficiently. Yeah. A lot of uh, pro players will say that it's actually better to pop the Void Caller yourself when you can and just bite the bullet and hope that nothing comes out rather than letting your opponent dictate um, what pops out because interesting uh, it doesn't allow them to control the state of the board immediately after like a doom guard pops out like yeah. a doom guard they get to charge it in control it immediately whereas if you're the one who controls it then uh, you are able to set up your board in a way to best defend against you know the possibility against. of a doom guard oh. so it's it's a really tough t decision to make and I mean he wasn't he played around it as much as he could. It just eventually that thing's going to die, and eventually whatever's on the other side is going to come out. So, um, Also, there's a pos if you're popping on your turn, you're also making it so... What if there was a Void Walker and an Imp King boss also in the hand? Which was an Imp King boss the next current turn. If that was a card sooner, if he had been the one who was controlling the Void Caller popping out, he could have got a, a Void Imp King boss out instead. Yeah, so. that's true. I don't think there was <laughs> much that he could do... Um, I guess I'm just trying to explore all the possible yeah. situations. Just because, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know if that is, like, the the pl best EV play that you could make. It's a really tough card to deal with. Yeah, it definitely is. I would love, like, I'm sure there's some numbers simulator genius out there that can actually do it and see, like, all the times that it actually happens where it's correct or incorrect to do it. Because right now I think a lot of the evidence and statistical stuff is anecdotal. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, would really, really love to see something like that. But nevertheless, we move on into the good old Hunter yet again up against the Druid. Right now, it is tied one and one as Shrevecrow was able to even it up in that last battle. And... Alrighty. This is a little bit awkward for Druid. We were talking about this earlier. This is tough. This is a tough matchup. Uh, well, he's got Wild Growth, so that makes things a little bit, more, a little bit easier. Um, but... Um, this is sort of... So this deck is really tough for Druid for a couple reasons. Druids struggle with Hunter a lot because the inconsistencies with their early game can just kill them. If they don't have a drop a play until turn 4, sometimes they can just die. Yep. And the strength, this deck, this hybrid Hunter, which has elements of Face Hunter and elements of Midrange Hunter, sort of has the best of both worlds as far as dealing with Druid. They have a lot of early pressure, which Druid struggles with. But one of the reasons Druid can win is they can um, either stabilize or race. And the mid-range portion of this deck make it so that it's really hard for Druid to stabilize. Because you get through the early game, you get through the pesky Leper Gnomes and the Glaive Zooka, mm -hmm. and then you hit a high main. And just when you thought you'd stabilized, this this uh, hybrid mid-range face hunter deck can just push through for the win. Yeah. So um, it's really tough. And even though Druid, I said, doesn't have too many unfavorable matchups, like their worst matchup is like 40% because of the mechanics of Wild Growth and Innervate, this is one of their worst. Sure. Sure. And Emperor Thorson is kind of a useless card in this a lot of the times just because it's like you can't play it and it be super helpful because you're losing a lot of tempo. I mean, what? given it is a 5-5 that's being dropped on the field, but for 6 mana, you're not normally not in a position where you can actually play this and have it win you the game, you need to be in a winning position, and then you play this to help out. So this is kind of like a dud card, very yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. A Wrath will pop out a Druid of the Claw here. 
The one thing the Emperor Thorsen does do is it can allow you... I mean, depending on your hand, sometimes you can open up, even though you're losing tempo on the turn that you play it. If you have five cards in your hand, you're basically giving yourself two and a half innervates to use for the following turn. So, it, Interesting. It, it effectively makes it so that um, even though there's a potential for you to fall behind on that turn, there's mm -hmm. a potential for you to come back plus some on the next turn. It also opens up more opportunities for you to race. Because yeah. if you have combo piece in your hand, being able to put out combo one turn earlier, or even just maybe double savage or one turn earlier can win you games. So. Yeah, that's true. If you're not too far behind, then it's good. But if you're behind, then sometimes you don't have the luxury of being able to sure. play a six mana five five and that's it. Like six mana five five with no immediate effect on the board can sometimes be rough. Yeah, understandable. Like there's a, like right now, he had an option to put an Emperor Thor's hand, but Drew the Claw has an immediate effect because it blocks damage next turn. Yeah, yep. And I like this, he hero powered, went for the trade, that way his uh, his Druid of the Claw stays out a lot longer. And now we're gonna see the Pilot Shredder being dropped on turn four. Pilot of Shredder. Oh yeah. So we talked a little bit last week about the real life implications of Hearthstone cards. Seems a little bit unrealistic that Pilot of Shredder is basically implying that whatever card comes out of it was driving it. Or captured. Nope, driving it. Yeah, you're right. It was driving it. It has to be. So there's a lot of two drops that see don't what it's seem being like... There, though. That don't seem like they'd fit in a Pilot of Shredder. But I digress. Just one of those things that keeps me up at night, you know? I feel you. All right, nice position now, as we were talking about. See, this is what I'm talking about. You have your... your. I, I felt like Druid got a nice little tiny advantage to be able to drop this Thor's in. And now he's able to kind of, like, not seize momentum, but he, he already was ahead from that Druid of the Claw. And this is going to potentially maintain that. Yeah. This isn't the best of hands to have reduced it's by true. Thorsan. Like a three mana swipe and a four mana Drew the Claw, great, but two mana BGH doesn't help you that much. Do you just BGH here? You can you can use everything but the swipe right now. I mean, uh, that's pretty wasteful. Yeah. <laughs> so BGH, you don't want to make Unleash the Hound stronger. Um, oh, BGH is yeah. good in this matchup if you can put your opponent on not having Doctor Boom, which you can't, or if you if putting BGH on the board. Set you up for lethal the following turn. I see. I see. Um, I mean, it's good as a body, and it might buy you time, but I'm not sure how to, uh, how effective it'll be unless you can put him on not having Dr. Boom. Uh, but he's going to play it, and there is a possibility. No, there's not even a possibility for lethal. I'm not sure how much I like that. Oh! Strife Crow. Playing around Explosive Shot. Okay, so playing around Explosive Shot is something that players in Constructed never do. But Strife Girl always puts in the possibility that anything could be in this. Oh, sorry, Cross. Uh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Got a little bit confused there. Okay, cross, so cross played around the Explosive Shot. I see. It's a card that you don't see in Constructed very often. But when I see players play around it, when they're 99% sure that Explosive Shot's not there, slightly impressive. Slightly. Could have been an accident. It could have. It could have. There's only like two other combinations that he could possibly put his creatures in. All right. But, so, you know. So we'll proc this right now. This is another good reason why you should play BGH is to proc a freezing trap. Makes sense. That was one that I forgot about. It's going to go ahead and silence this. Probably just trade out the doors in. Oh. Okay, shade first. So this is one thing that What's I was he thinking. deliberating? Sorry. Uh, this is one thing that... Um, <laughs> okay, it was an accident. This confirms playing around Explosive Shot was an accident. Well, he could still play... Because now he's playing right into Explosive Shot. Unless he plays something else. He could play the Keeper right in the middle. Okay. That still doesn't play around it. Cross. Oh, no, he could he could check the Keeper out all the way on the left-hand oh. side. Trade out with the okay. Thorson. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, he has one card in his hand. It's turn nine for him. What does he need things to be cheaper for, you know? Okay. He... <laughs> <laughs> He's not playing. 
<laughs> he just made me look like an idiot. Thank you, Cross. God. It was just a, a was, very serendipitous. I was giving him so much credit, and it was all just... <laughs> it was all sham, bro. A big accident. Well, Knife Dragon on these downs is pretty good, but he's pretty far behind right now. Yeah. So I'm not sure how effective these juggles could be. Best case scenario, he picks off the shade, uh, but that's pretty unlikely. Let's find out. One, face. Two, face. Oh, oh. we got one. Oh. 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 Okay, well, uh, that's not too bad. The juggle on... Yeah, that's actually pretty bad. Worst case scenario, I think, would be if all the juggles... Like, if one juggle went to the um, shade and then all the other juggles went to the keeper, but... Okay, he has to hero power here. He cannot do a freezing trap. Well... Because it's just going to go keeper of the forest, gets back to the hand, he kills what's on the board, he goes... Uh... Yeah, right? Well. I mean, he's trying to maintain his board. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what and he does. Uh, the, the other thing is, when else is he going to use the freezing that's trap? That's true. Um, either way, that knife dragon is going to die. It's just whether or not yeah. he protects, he blocks damage from the board. Or also, protects his knife dragon or slightly. His like Glazuka is kind of weird, too, because, like, it won't get played for a while. Yeah. Because once this freezing uh, trap gets proc, what ends up happening is he still has another charge. He doesn't want to be used as Glazuka, yeah. so he has kind of a, like, useless card. But as you said, when else are you going to use your freezing trap? It does three damage instead of two with a Glazuka. So definitely a tough situation for the Warrior Strife Crows. Not looking in the best spot, but anything can happen. I mean, Druid is at 13 health. Yeah. Both players are sort of out of cards, and in a top deck war, mm -hmm. um, it's hard to say he will come out on top because Cross's cards inherently have more value because he's got the slower deck. But in the the hero power war, hmm. that's actually even going to come out even there unless Cross is having to use his yeah. to clear off creatures because he'll effectively Kay. do one damage and gain one health, which would make Strife Crows effectively only do one damage and he wouldn't be gaining one health. So it's true. It's tough to say. Okay, just thinking of all the cards that help. Obviously, this pilot of trader does not. I mean, it helps with board control, but he really wants taunters up. He wants a way to heal. Yep. So we're looking for the two lures that he's missing that he hasn't found into, and we're also looking for um, belcher. a belcher. Um, also combo. Oh yeah. <laughs> to Very be able true. to close the game out. Um, but this puts him in a really good position. He's going to be able to clear off the board. He's very healthy. Uh, but he doesn't really have tools to race. Yeah. He only sees the shade now just because he needs to pile on as much damage as possible. Ooh. All right. So So he holds his hand here, right? He okay. actually just goes hero power well, pass. He's, he's going to calculate how much damage he can do over the next two turns. He wants to put himself in the best position to set up lethal over two turns. This turn he's going to do five damage. If he doesn't play anything. Yeah. Okay, so he's going to put his opponent at 8, which is effectively going to be 9 the next turn. So next turn he could um, use the Eagle Horn Bow again, then Hero Power for 5, yep. Unleash for at least 2, and then Glaive Zuka for 3 for 8. So if his opponent plays one more creature, he would have lethal next turn, as long as it's not a taunt or a heal. Yep. Um, so I think just using your Eagle Horn Bow and then Hero Power yeah. would be the best option. Now, you can play around... You can't... Oh, man. You can... So interesting, man. You can play around both pieces of the combo here. Oh, you can't play around both pieces of the combo. So you might as well... Okay, is this more damage over the two turns? No, it's not. Does it showcase his hand too much when he just holds everything? Wow, there it is. Sludge Belcher. I mean, he did have a high chance of getting uh, one of the money cards. Again, two Ancient of Loras, uh, Belcher... You know, he's yeah. still looking at, like, 15 cards. It's it's 20% of the time he, he draws into something advantageous. Uh, at the very least, uh, is he what? does he run two Belchers in this? Just one? Two Belchers. Two Belchers? Uh, a lot of Druid decks, it depends what tech cards they put in, yeah. will run one Azure Drake, two Druid, Druid of the Claw, and one Sludge Belcher. 
Okay. Uh, but you can also run one Azure Drake, two Druid of the Claw, two Sludge Belchers, or two Azure Drakes, two Druid of the Claws, one Sludge Belcher. Um, it all depends on like what your bottom end is. If you decide to include Zombie Chow, if you decide to include tech cards like Mind Control Tech, <laughs> if you top out at Rag, or if you top out at like Boom, if you decide to include uh, no. Scenarius. So your five drop is usually the place where you cut cards in order to make room for tech. But I don't know. I can't remember if you played a Sludge Belcher earlier. Okay. Well, at this point, uh, it looks like, uh, by the way, his um, Unleash the Hounds was the correct play given up based on what happened. But yeah. that's uh, obviously very results oriented. But having this Belcher here, he would ha be nowhere close to lethal. Up. Yeah. Whereas now, he can conceivably do it. The question is do you keep the Haunted Creeper in your hand or not? You have to. You have to, right? For the for the eventual Because you're only No Cause what if he heals? Ugh. Like he might be saying to himself, Oh, let's just stay alive. Alright, so I mean, okay, you throw out the Haunted Creeper and you get rid of a kill command win condition, but you still maintain a quick shot win condition. That's true. And this could act as a heal for the hunter or for Strife Crow. Because if Cross doesn't have lethal, which he doesn't, it might force your opponent to p actually play or kill the Haunted Creeper. Correct. To avoid being killed by a silence or, well, he'd be killed by a silence anyway, to avoid being killed by a kill command. Yeah. Actually, no, kill command would be, would be, kill command. be dead anyway. Oh, man. Well, if Dude, I that's why I said if it was an Ancient of Lore drop here and he just goes to the five heal. Yeah. Well, either he, it would be gone. Either way, he wins with kill command. Cur so I guess he doesn't need the beast. No, with with ancient lore, he heals for five, and then he's not going to be able to get through the taunt, and he just kills the beast. That's why he needs to keep the beast in his hand. He wouldn't have been able to get through anyway, because he would still be he'd be able to do seven damage. He would have been at ten health with ancient of lore. So this way, he I think we're agreeing on the same thing. Okay. Okay. And that's not it. Nope. Well, no. He needed silence, quick shot, or kill command. Yeah. He had a lot too. He had two two kill commands remaining. This deck usually only runs one quick shot okay. and one iron BKL. So four out of how many cards did he have? Can we just see that real quick. Like sixteen. Well, five. Uh, but yeah. he goes ahead and concedes, and Cross gonna take a two to one lead. Man, brutal. In the series. Just one game away from securing a spot in the semifinals, and uh, he would phase lead paint in the semifinals. Hunter, um, Hunter being actually Strifco's downfall here. Yeah, he's definitely struggling to find a win with that deck, and he still has two two decks left to to find wins with. He we haven't seen his warrior yet, and he still has to find a win with the with the hunter. Um, Cross, on the other hand, only has one deck left, and that's his warrior. Hunter's going to be really tough to find a win. That's rough, man. Yeah. Now, Do you just lead out with your your Hunter no matter what? Well, either way, you have to win with both, so it really yeah. doesn't matter. Um, you can make arguments for momentum, like put out your best matchup first to try and throw your opponent on tilt, uh, have the best likelihood to win. But in the end, you have to win with both decks. So it really doesn't matter what he has to throw out here, considering Cross is choosing Warrior no matter what. All right. Um, but Sharker's on the ropes. Yeah, it's not looking too good, very clearly. Uh, and a very surprising result, especially after what we saw from this last week. Of course, Cross mm -hmm. just kind of fizzled out when we saw him in the uh, the regular Legendary series. Um, but he's uh, he's given Stripe Crow more than a run for his money. As you said, on the ropes, and not a lot of people expected this situation. Yeah. Nevertheless, it's been very... Very unlucky, I would say, too, for a strife. Ah, I shouldn't say unlucky, but, you know, variance hasn't swung in his direction. Yeah. Well, Warrior versus Warrior. Now, we have yet to... S Actually, we did see Cross is running the uh, Patron Warrior, but we've yet to see Strife Crow's Warrior deck yet. Um, I don't know if I'd pin him to be a Control Warrior in this matchup just to try and uh, feed on the Patron Warriors that he would know would be in this. But if I had to make a, a guess, I'd say this is probably going to be a mirror matchup with two Patron Warrior decks. We we'll find out. And indeed it is. Double Patrons on both sides. <laughs> Those are actually 
nearly identical hands on both sides, too. So both <laughs> players have Grim Patron, Ex Acolyte, and Execute. Cross, of course, has a Whirlwind. Because he gets four cards, that would be kind of funny if Strife Crow's first card in his deck would be a Whirlwind. Or if he mulligans away and gets it back. Nope, it's an Emperor Thorsan. Okay. Well, Grim Patron, uh, this is one of the only decks where, or only matchups, we keep Grim Patron. Just because, usually in a mirror matchup, Grim Patron Warrior versus Grim Patron Warrior, the first player to flood the board with their own patrons wins. Mm -hmm. Because it's so hard uh, yeah. for your opponent, Patron Warrior, to remove your patrons. And usually, if you put them on the back foot, and they're having to remove your patrons, they're not developing developing patrons of their own. Yeah. Because they can't develop patrons of their own without giving you more patrons. I, I think the only way to come back from that is you already have slope. You have you already have damage being placed on your opponent and then you find something like a Frothing Berserker, Whirlwind, and then you go for the kill like the next turn. That's yeah. it. Like that's your only win condition at that point. And let's be honest, that's that happens so rarely because what's the, the probability that you're able to put that much damage yeah. on your opponent, and then they take board control, and then you still have some sort of, you know, part of the combo left. Not too common. All right. Well, Stripe goes in a rough position, um, not forced, but decides to throw out uh, his Acolyte of Pain, mm -hmm. just all willy-nilly. Just because he's unhappy with his hand, he's willing to take the risk that it just gets Fiery War Axed or Death in order to try and find another draw. Well, the play is Fiery War Axe into Armor Up. Not going to do anything with that. Just passes. When this match first came out and players didn't know how to play it, it was so funny to watch or so funny to play on ladder. Like when Grim Patron Warriors first came out, what would happen is both players would be too afraid to make a move. That literally the game for the first six turns would just be both players weaponing up and then hitting each other's face. <laughs> like my first mirror match of in Grim Patron Warrior, literally we both Fiery War Axe on turn two, smacked each other in the face. On turn three, we armored up, smacked each other in the face again. <laughs> and then on turn four, we both equipped Despite and just smacked each other in the face again. <laughs> like, both players are, are so, were so afraid to throw out Acolytes because they think they needed to activate their Acolyte. They were so afraid to throw out a lot of their key cards like Frothing Berserker and Warsong Commander because they didn't know how to, like, uh, effectively do combos yet. So so yeah. do you think do you think that the idea still maintains where you need to keep your acolytes, no. or no, 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 you no. could just go for the cycle. It, one I mean, for it, one. it all—it's it, all situational. This deck has sure. so many options at any given time. Uh, Strife Crow threw out his acolyte there because uh, he wasn't happy with what he had in his hand. He was willing to take the risk of his acolyte getting killed and only getting one draw because even just one draw would improve his hand by a lot. So yeah, um, but this this is actually I think a pretty big advantage for Cross. I, I like his oh, hand a lot better. So. The only thing that Strife Crow has going for him is uh, he's got pretty big combos. He has Emperor Thor's hand, which he could just, put, just pop down right now. Yeah, and then he's got there. both of his Warsong Commanders and both, both of, of his, his Grim Patrons. Oh, and God. his War Ones are going to cost zero. And that's, also, and also, there. I mean, that's I, absurd. Think, I think you actually trade your 2-2 and your 2-4 at this point. Because you are terrified of keeping anything with less than three out there, right? Yeah. You have to. No, he's going to maintain them. And that just gives extra charges for the gr those Grim Patrons to actually bust out. And these start Grim Patrons are going to be ridiculous! Oh, no. Okay, so this actually helps, though. He can spawn 4,000 Grim Patrons this turn! This turn. Wow. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And he can deal with that Thorazin very effectively. Very effectively. Strife Crow's hand seemed weak at the beginning. And now it's just but powered. He got through the early game without giving a significant advantage over to Cross. There we go. And now, not only is he going to be able to spawn a thousand Grim Patrons, but he's going to be the first player to do so. And he also has a zero mana execute, so he can take out his opponent's Thor Sand as well, yeah. relatively easily, with just the Whirlwind. It's going to get caught in, like, residual damage. So, there is one thing, though. You were saying that he could spawn a lot, but technically he can only spawn, like, three. No, he can spawn six. Oh, if he whirlwinds, he whirlwinds first. right now, attacks in, he'll have, uh, uh, well, no, he'll have, he'll, yeah, he can spawn four. Okay. Yeah. No, he can spawn six, he just whirlwinds again. No, because if he, oh. Uh, yeah, double whirlwind. Wow. And then he'll be left with, yeah, with six. He can hit one in, he'll have a full he'll board have, of them, no. execute the doors in, he's got a full board. Five, right? Wow! Or, or excuse me, he'll only have four. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah. Right. All six of those puppies. Oh, sorry. Five. Five, five. five. Okay. Well, I was, 
I was counting six creatures. I was counting six creatures on the board. Everybody, get, get in, in here. here. And he not only that, but he puts him at fourteen. So he's lethal. Eleven. 11. <laughs> he has lethal, and he has the combo again. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> you remove all these grim patrons. He okay. does just the same thing. And do we have? Nope. Wow, sad life, man. Well, okay. Because he doesn't even have War Song Commander. This is what I was talking about. You, like, you throw out your War Song, you throw out your Frothing Berserker. You know, you, you might be able to do something. Not really. Okay. Well, well, let's look at legitimate ways. The card all the way to the left is a Whirlwind. Yep. That doesn't help him. Nope. He can ex. Well, no, it might. He can execute, swing with Despite on one of them. Yeah. Um, and then... And no. Then. He would have to Cruel Taskmaster, the Warsong Commander. Even though the Grim Patriots are threatening, the, the bigger threat is the Warsong Commander because that's what enables not only for him to spawn more that can yeah. immediately do damage, but also to spawn damage from so his hand. I think he just has to Fiery War Axe here. Oh my god. Okay. Here's RNG for you. What? You fire War Axe, you drop Dr. Boom, you Whirlwind, and you hope that the Boom bots... Well, no, because then he's going to spawn a thousand Grim Patrons just from no, the Whirlwind. He, he he's only going to spawn one. See? The Whirlwind's only going to spawn one. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Give it to me, baby. Let's go. All right. RNG time, baby. Sad thing is... You know what's going to happen. He's going to spawn four. It's going to hit one for one and the other one for two. All right, here we go. Come on. Come on. I want it. These boom bots are make a break, too. Oh. Okay. Okay, it's still like the best scenario that could happen here, right? Yeah. Well, it's not actually the best, but <laughs> you know what I mean. Well, he could just war on Commander Great Patient again. <laughs> Have three of them. He could. Interesting spot, man. Very interesting spot. I love what we're seeing. Yeah. So he's just going to go for it throughout the... Dread Corsair makes a ton of sense because now it allows him to maintain his Warsong Commander out there. Because he knows, like, he, he just spent basically his entire hand. Um, he just needs to put continued pressure on his opponent. Yeah. And keep leaning and leaning and leaning and not give him oh. any space to breathe. Executes a fantastic draw. Oh, yeah. He can clear off... Uh, Almost. Well, no, because the weapons in his hand are virtually useless. Uh, Execute allows him to clear off the Grim Patron that's injured. Yeah. He throws his uh, Doctor Boom into the 3-3 three, three, and then kills off the Warsong Commander. Uh, he takes uh, two damage, so he'd be at five. He leaves three damage on the board, and there's four damage from the hand. Armor up would be seven. He's dead no matter what. Yeah. Yeah, he's dead. I mean, he doesn't know that he's dead yet. Well, of course. <laughs> but. <laughs> I mean, he can make it. A, he can make it. He's, a, he's trying. He's trying. I mean, there's a lot of things that kill him. Like, Death Bite would kill him. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, this is the best way to, that he can yeah, survive. You have yeah. to play around. This is the least amount of damage he can take. Um, he'll build a big Frothing Berserker. Put himself in the best possible position he could for next turn. Um, Man, it's exact lethal, too, which is so brutal. Wait, 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 wait. No. No, it's still he's taking I was gonna say, he's taking three damage or two damage. It doesn't matter. I was thinking there could be yeah. like a possibility for him to like double equip Death Bite to get oh, whirlwind no. effects after he killed the Grim Patron, but the dream, bro. Yeah. G G. Alright. Shrekro will tie up the series two two here. And we are going to game number five, where we will see again the hunter attempt. To take a win off of this warrior. Yeah, this this deck seems to have been the liability so far for Stripe Crow, the Hunter deck. So we'll see. But Stripe Crow, like you said, ties up the series at two to two. We're going to a game five. Three matches in today, and two of them have already gone to game five. This has been a a pretty intense Hearthstone day. I mean, they're all looking for redemption, man. Yep, looking to redeem themselves. Of course, if you guys don't know, twenty five thousand dollars is going to be on the line at the season finals happening June fifth to June seventh. Going to be a lot of fun. It's a lot I, of money. I might be passing by. Might say hello to you guys. Really excited for that. Um, I'll be there. I know you will. Uh, and also, 
There's an open qualifiers coming up very, very soon. If you guys are interested in participating and trying to qualify for the tournament that these fellows are, make sure you check out, what's the website again? Legendaryseries.com. I love it. I love it when you say it, bro. Yeah. Nevertheless, let's go into game number five. As we were talking about Hunter versus Warrior, not looking good for Strife Crow, my friend. Yeah, this is a rough matchup. Uh, a lot of pros are are pretty adamant about saying how tough this matchup is for the Hunter. Um, at the beginning, it wasn't so much because people, <laughs> the very first Grim Patriot Warrior decks actually didn't run Armor Smith, uh, which was a little bit interesting. But uh, since it's been put in, uh, this matchup is really hard. Yeah. And not only because of Armor Smith, just because of Armor in general. Uh, the ability for Warriors to uh, control and stabilize the board early on and be able to draw into their combos is just matched by no other class. The ability for... They have weapons. Uh, in an emergency, they can use Whirlwind and Interrage to clear the board. Really tough for Hunters to get going. And there's just so... Like, if you look at the proportion of one health creatures in this deck, there's just so many more. So it just boosts like the power of Whirlwind that much more. Yeah. As you're saying, it should still be used for emergency cases. It shouldn't just be like, oh, you dropped a Leper Gnome. Let me Whirlwind. Willy nilly Whirlwind. <laughs> no big deal. Got rid of it. Got it, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, this this Hunter deck fares off a little better against Patron Warrior just because it has a little more resilient drops. Pilot of Shredder is a really great card. Yep. Uh, Animal Companion also has the potential to be really great, especially if you can get it out before a Despite has the potential to come out and ruin your day. Yeah, you want a Misha at that point, too. Um, and this hand is not the best for Cross. No, it isn't. I he's, heard he's starting got out with two Battle Rage is not the best. No, but I have a funny story to tell you. Go on. Dan might hate me for telling this. Dan? Yeah, so Dan and I played a best of five Okay. Um, before the game. He actually beat me in the best of five, so I want to... Uh, preface it with that. Okay. Uh, so the the one game that we played was not um, really representative of the series as a whole. But I was playing my patented Hobgoblin Warrior. Oh. And uh, patented. I, he was playing his patented Mech Rogue. And uh, I actually started that game with double Battle Rage in my opening hand, and I still beat him. Wow. Yep. You must be stuff. You must be really, really a lot yeah. more skilled than Dan then. Yeah. Oh, no, he beat me. He beat me overall <laughs> in the series three to two, but it was still oh, super close. Fun game nonetheless. Dan, um, you know, through my history with uh, with just playing with him, it, whether it be League, Starcraft, whatever it might be, the guy is like a true grinder, man. Like, yeah, that guy just churns out game after game after game and just tries new stuff all all the time. Yep, really, really cool to watch him. Loves to experiment. Yep, it's like he's in college forever. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. He's a scholar. Scholar of all things good. And the the esports scholar. That's right, man. Well, the deck that hasn't improved very much, or the hand hasn't improved very much, but Father Berserker is actually a great draw to just throw out on turn three against this deck because it'll a lot of times get two for one, but that's a freezing trap. And uh, so he's going to have that thing protected. He could throw out his pilot at Shredder here. It's going to get eaten up by the, um, by the Fiery War Axe, but... That's a lot of damage he's taken to the face, That's and right. whatever's going to come out of this, Cross doesn't have any way to deal with. So, well, we'll find out if he has to deal with it. Watch. It's a Ooh, three damage. Doomsayer. I mean, yeah, he, that's beautiful. He has to. He, uh, he's going to just battle rage here because there's nothing else to do. He needs to improve his hand. At least yep. one battle rage needs to come out here. I'd say battle rage armor up would probably be the play. Um, I mean, he can. You could whirl. Uh, it just sounds so awful. He can whirl in battle rage, but whirlwind in that case effectively <laughs> yeah. just it, is just drawing you. Well, uh, that, it's, that's it's still trading, good. Yeah, uh, I mean, okay, potentially good, but see, I'm very unclear what to do in these spots. You know, like, is it correct for us to cycle out whirlwind or not? You know, when you, a lot of times I ask myself, like, okay. How dire is this situation? Am I 100% dead if I don't just start cycling and getting my good cards? Yeah. And well, one mana draw a card is actually really efficient. If you look at it in just yeah, that context. That's true. That's true. And it also, oh, the execute, yeah, okay. Well, execute is allows him to save a lot of damage. So. Yeah. So he is going to execute that. I mean, again, if we look at this in a vacuum just by this turn, it looks just awful. But in the grand scheme of things, I mean, he's looking for his combo. He's looking for ways on him staying alive, knowing that the later stages in the game, 
with the power of armor smiths and armor up, he will be able to weather the storm and be okay. Yep. Okay. Another one gets thrown out. There's that one component of the combo, but not going to help all too much right now. Well, he could he could proc the the freezing trap with armor smith, if you if that's what you're reading into. Yeah, he could also battle rage. He could uh, also battle for rage two. for two. Yeah, battle rage. See what happens. So if you battle rage for two, what can you draw into that allows you to deal with the bio Trader? You can draw into fire war axe. Uh -huh. Won't have enough mana for dice bite. Nope. Um, and that's pretty much it. That's it. Uh, Battle Rage also, since you have Warsong Commander in your hand. Oh, you could, uh, no. I was thinking Dread Corsair, but you don't have enough mana for that. You also need to address this Freezing Trap eventually. Or, I mean, he doesn't even know that it's Freezing Trap. You have to address this trap, period, eventually. So, uh, it, it might be best to approach that trap with the Armorsmith to preserve the six damage from the Frothy Berserker to try and preserve some of the pressure that you have on the board. I don't know if he's ever really going to... I mean, this game usually is very fast-paced. Yeah. So I'm not sure if you would ever have an opportunity to... Interesting. Oh, this is okay. Because he, it, it means so next turn he'll be able to proc the Freezing Trap almost regardless. Yeah. Um, the problem is right now... I think you can just... You can just go quick shot. Yeah, you can just Animal Companion. Throw the Paladin Shredder into the Armorsmith and then quick shot the Acolyte, and then all of a sudden, crosses in the, in the same spot that he was last turn where <laughs> he can't proc the Freezing Trap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To my side. Oh, man. And it's a Hopper! Oh, man, how beautiful! How how well did that just work out? All right, and then quick shot the Acolyte, exactly what you were saying. Yep. Yeah, per Skepper, man. Dark bomb. Oh, 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 the game. Okay, yeah, yeah, that makes. Of, of course, <laughs> of course. Um, and that way you get rid of the the main threat, and yeah. the acolyte will not be able to draw you any cards. Oh my yeah. god. I don't, I don't know why I was tunneling on the acolyte there. I mean, I thought in the back of my head the frothing berserker was still at four health, but that's obviously the better play. I mean, of course, he might still be able to get draws out of the acolyte, but I think you're more scared of. Him getting what now? Uh, a ten plus damage froth and berserker sure. into your face than you are of. Um, oh my gosh! And now he's just gonna throw out Thor's in. It's his whole turn, and he's gonna pass. I mean, he's, right. this is a lot of damage coming in from this turn. Yeah, I mean, he can bring him down to at least eleven. Yeah, uh, uh, this hybrid hunter focuses a little bit more on board control than a face hunter. Okay. Um. Like, he could Glaive Zuka here, trade in whatever four attack creature gets five attack um, into the Emperor Thor's hand. Interesting. Okay. Um, which I think, leaving that five body on the board, and I think that's what he wanted it to go on. See, I would think just go for face, but. Yeah. Also, interesting, I would throw out a Haunted Creeper here because, you know, you could use the Knife Juggler and activate the Haunted Creeper, and obviously you get two extra damage. Well, if he throws out the Knife Juggler here, I'm pretty sure that he's. Oh, he's going to throw out the Haunted Creeper. He's, he's expecting to trade um, because he wants to oh, get the makes knife. Makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, from whatever pops out of the Pilot Shredder. But he's thinking, how much damage could I do over the next two turns if I don't trade? He's got 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Yeah, he did go face. All right. All right. Well, he does have multiple ways for lethal next turn, even if one of the creatures gets cleared off the board with the Wolf Rider. Oh, man. That's brutal. I don't think there's any way for him to survive this. I don't think so either, man. Um, he can battle rage into something. Yeah, you have to trade your Thorson into the Huffer. Yeah, yeah. the Huffer, and then battle go rage. for it. What now? Battle rage it up. Or you five can... mana. Like, what's out there for five or three mana? No, not even. One mana? Execute? Because I'm thinking you could use your Warsong Commander. Your cruel taskmaster, and then something else, but man, that's brutal. Yeah. All right, battle rage. Nope, not gonna help. Not gonna help. Ah, uh, that helps. Uh, he can actually warsaw oh, commander, right. double cruel taskmaster. You're right. And trade. Uh, but if he does that, he doesn't armor up. Um, he'd actually still be alive because that's a glaive zuka. He would have three damage from the wolf rider, two from the glaive zuka, two from hero power. Striker has seven damage. 
from Pin next turn. Yep. Eight keeps him healthy. Warsaw Commander, double cool Taskmaster. All right. And hope that he can kill yeah. whatever comes out of this piloted shredder with a cool Taskmaster. Do you believe? Do you believe? He's running out of time. Oh my god. If this, whatever comes out of this pilot shredder has three health. Oh, no. It's, oh, wow. That's still oh, lethal. Oh, god. That stinks so bad because, of course, the Wolf Rider is going to gain off of that. Oh, my goodness. That is wow. brutal. And the Arcane Golem. Okay. He could have used both. Yeah, it wouldn't have It didn't matter. <laughs> and with the Flamethrower Totem, that's actually an absurd amount of overkill. <laughs> and Strive Crow is going to move on to the semifinals to face Lead Paint. By the skin of his teeth, too, man. <laughs> oh, God. By the skin of his teeth. Although that was probably the best possible situation we could have had for the Hunter in the very last game. He had three chances yeah. to get, well, to have his opponent have kind of a bad draw. He finally got it in the last uh, the last game. And of all of the classes that he was able to beat, it was that Grim Patron Warrior, which yeah. is kind of crazy. It's a tough matchup. Uh, Cross did have a really bad hand to start yes. off. Uh, double Definitely. Battle Rage. And he's not um, TJ Sanders, are you? Know? Yeah, he was. He was given some some tools in the, the mid game to try and stabilize, but by that time, it's so hard. Strife Crow just had yeah. ridiculous. It, it took him three tries, but he finally manages to find one with the Hunter. And our semifinals are set. First semifinal, of course, is going to going to be um, GCT Turth versus Chalky, and then uh, Lead Paint. Oh, that should be Lead Paint versus Strife Crow. That's okay. Uh, if you guys are wondering, like, hey, why did GCT Turth get all the way up to that position? It's because he's the one that actually got second in one of the, f the recent Legendary Series tournaments. Yeah. So because of that, he gets seated a little bit higher. We haven't seen him just yet, but we will in our next series. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Uh, so GCT Turth versus um, Chucky, I believe, uh, coming up next. And um, Chucky, in his first match of the day, he struggled a lot. Uh, it was a 3-2. It was a really close series. Uh, just like we saw with Strife Crow earlier, um, he had trouble winning with one of his decks, but it was his Rogue. So it's going to be really interesting to see uh, what's going to happen in that one. Uh, but, of course, that match, plus the second semifinal and the final still to come here on Group B of the Redemption Series. So don't go, go, don't go anywhere, guys. We'll be right back.